welcome everybody to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood. Wisdom from Our Neighborhood is a program of Paths to Understanding, which is formerly Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. We do that through telling inspiring stories, nurturing relationships, and acting together for the common good. This episode today is an introduction to Jewish and Islamic art and the heart of, of those two traditions. It's a part of the Interfaith Week sponsored by Holden Village and Paths to Understanding. We will have six nights of live webinars starting Sunday, July 19th and ending on July 24th. The webinars, which will happen at 6 p.m. Pacific time, will include interfaith conversations and also an opportunity for you to engage in art on the topic of us, them, and all, weaving our identities and common humanity within the unity of life. You can register for those live webinars at www.holdenvillage.org. Today, we're so happy to have with us uh, Amina Qureshi, who's a student of the traditional Islamic art. She was born in Qatar and immigrated to Canada, where she spent her childhood and completed her education. She received an honors bachelor's in science, majoring in psychology and art and art history at the University of Toronto. Intrigued by the beautiful patterns found in Islamic lands from Eastern China to Spain, she began to study Islamic art. The study of Islamic art took her to London where she took courses at the art of Islamic pattern. Amina currently lives in Seattle, Washington where she teaches Islamic art. She teaches geometric and arabesque patterns at the local libraries, Seattle public school system, and at her local community centers and mosques in the Puget Sound area. Amina, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Terry. Um... We're happy to have you with us, Amina. And we're also so happy to have Rainer Waldman Atkins, a Hebrew calligrapher, drafts, draftsman, painter, muralist, printmaker, with a Master of Fine Arts degree from University of Washington. He is the Program Art Specialist with Launch at Kimball Elementary School, Seattle, teaches B'nai Mitzvah at Kadima Reconstructionist Community, and is a freelance multi-generational educator in art, art history, and Jewish culture, aesthetics, visual midrash, ethics, and history. An activist for Israel-Palestine peace for three decades, Reiner is a member of J Street and traveled in May of 2017 to Israel and the Palestinian territories with the Center for Jewish Nonviolence. Reiner, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. So Reiner, I'd like to start with you and just ask, how did you get your start as an artist and, and who influenced you? Um, my, my history as an artist is a family affair because my great uncle, worked on the cartoon character Betty Boop and, and invented Popeye's dog and did other really remarkable work as an animator. And he inspired my mother, Selma Waldman, to become an artist. And then in turn, here I am working as an artist. I've always been surrounded by, by art and art making and also significantly art and art making in terms of making the world a better place. I've been very lucky in who's in, who my teachers have been, um, including when I was in graduate school, my graduate advisor was the artist Jacob Lawrence, who was a remarkable person to work with. And talking about someone who could take art and connect it with, with repairing the world and social justice. He was a really remarkable person to work with. I have a lot of different influences. I suppose what I could say is that there's two streams of influence. One is what I would call very secular, universal work. And then the other is my involvement in very specifically Jewish traditions of art. And, and those move parallel to one another, and I've been working recently to see how they can intersect a lot more. I mean, I'd lo love to hear your story about uh, how you got to start as an artist and who influenced you. Um, I've always been drawn to the visual arts, art making and creating. It was always sort of my um, 
creative outlet. And I took all art all throughout uh, high school. And in university, I took it as my second major, starting in my third year, as this decision that, you know, just studying the sciences and biology and sociology, it wasn't enough for me. Um, I felt something missing because I had always been doing art in high school. So I decided to take it on as my second major. And it really opened my eyes. I had never really um, liked history per se because I found it kind of boring. But art, studying art history, you're studying history through the lens of art and architecture and religion. And it was very eye-opening to me. And I also got a chance to learn more about um, my religion uh, through the art history aspect. So that really inspired me. And I also met an artist in university who had graduated in London from the Prince's School of Traditional Arts. And she really inspired me to pursue Islamic art. And that's sort of where it began. Um, so Amina, I'd like to ask you and you and your son, Adam, uh, why art is important to you and why it's important for human beings and human community. So art is important to me because it's a way of expression and it's a way of, um, it's a creative outlet for creating and, um, I'm so sorry. Um, so. <laughs> okay, I have an idea. How about if we let, we let Reiner go next okay. on this question and that'll, that'll give you a second mm -hmm. uh, to, to feel centered again, but don't, don't, don't feel bad, it's all good. Okay. So, um, so Reiner, I'd be interested to know why art's important to you personally, and also why it's important for human beings and human community. I think that art is a large part of what makes us human. People have been, we've been finding art going back 100,000 years. And, you know, there, there obviously has been the creative impulse to use art. I suppose I should say all forms of the arts to show how to show our response to the world. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge that that comes both in very beautiful forms. And also there are, are forms of art that ask really difficult questions and wrestle with difficult issues. And, and both of those and, and to take both the expression of beauty and, and the wrestling with the issues that confront us in our lives and mix those together is an incredibly human thing to do. I also believe practically speaking that we have different learning styles, different ways to communication and, and the arts and certainly visual art are one form of communication that can open up ways of interacting with the world that other forms of communication don't. And that's very, very important. And also the making of art engages our minds and our bodies in a way that's unique. One of the things I've noticed working with young people is that there has been a decline in their fine motor skills based on age. One thing that you hear a lot is that fifth graders now have the fine motor skills that we used to associate with third graders. When we're using our hand, when we're working with our hands and our mind together, it's, it's a more complete way of thinking and interacting than doing only one thing or the other. And indeed, one of the theories that scientists have is that the use of our hands and by extension, the making of art is what helped our brains develop as humans became humans. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Reiner. Um, Amina, what would you like to share about why art is important to you and to human community? Um, I believe art is a universal language. It's a means of communication and expression. It's a way to share your culture and experiences and a means to bring people together. So in the process, so I teach art, I teach art in the community, and my goal as an artist when I'm teaching art, I'm teaching Islamic art, which is 
a cultural art form. Um, it's a means for me to share my culture and some of my religion and with people who attend my classes. And in a way, for people who may have never experienced or seen another side of Muslims as well. So people may have a singular idea of what Muslims are through media or, or different outlets, but through art, we are talking about culture and religion without really touching upon the controversial aspects or the political aspects. Instead, we're just creating um, sort of something that's beautiful together. Thank you so much. And I, I, I've been thinking about my own kind of relationship to art, which, um, you know, I, I don't always take time to do a lot of art now. I, I did more when I was younger. Um, I think about this quote from Joseph Campbell, which is, if you change the metaphor, or if you want to change the world, you change the metaphor. And, and I found myself a lot of times in life, especially in moments where I've been unclear about my path forward and engaging with art of various kinds sort of helped me to recognize the metaphor under which I was operating and offered me some other, some other clues and some greater freedom uh, to kind of see the world differently. Um, I'm, I'm also interested in this, um, you know, what do the Jewish and, and scriptures, Reiner, say about the role of the artist and, and is that expanded in commentaries or other traditions? Yes, it is. Before I answer that, I just want to make a comment about what we were just talking about. First, yeah. Amina, what you were saying about the connection between art and identity and art playing a role in really helping people have a very expanded sense of themselves in the world, I think is really important. And especially when we're in a multi-ethnic society like ours, the role of the arts to really help people celebrate their culture and understand other cultures is really significant. Uh, one more thing I would say is that in Hebrew, and it kind of, it, it segues into what you're asking, Terry, most recently. Hebrew, like I think probably with Arabic, um, works from, Hebrew words come from a root, and the root for, and art or craft in Hebrews, omanut. And it comes from the same root as the word imunah, which means faith, and the word amen, which of course we know. So the idea that faith, creativity, and saying basically so be it, affirmation of faith, are connected is a, is a very nice metaphor. Wow. And and of course, I, the the words the, the word for faith, you know, emuna is also related to Amina's name. <laughs> That's basically your name, isn't it? So, um, in the Jew in the Jewish tradition, one of the things that pops up is is the figure of Betzalel in the Torah, in the in the Bible. And Betzalel is someone who steps in when Moses can't do what needs to be done. And and when there's the whole experience happening around Mount Sinai, the revelation at Mount Sinai and building and building a sanctuary, a big dash. In, you know, a traveling sanctuary in the desert. Um, Moses keeps going up Mount Sinai to get instructions from, from the divine about how to do this. And he keeps not understanding it. And finally, according to the, I, I, have, a, I have a quote from, from the commentary. Twice Moses ascended Mount Sinai to receive instructions from God. And twice he forgot the instructions on his descent. The third time, God took a menorah of fire and showed him every detail of it, and yet Moses still found it hard to form a clear conception of the menorah. Finally, God told him, go to Bezalel and he'll make it. When Bezalel had no difficulty in executing it, 
Moses cried out in amazement. To me, it was shown many times by the Holy One, blessed be. Yet I found it hard to grasp, but you without seeing it, compassionate with your natural intelligence. Surely you must have been standing in the shadow of God, which in Hebrew is Betzeel. In other words, his name. While the Holy One was showing me its construction. So the idea that art has art and artists have a very significant role in showing us what's wonderful and holy in the world is very, very ingrained right there in the Torah and the commentaries from the Torah. Also in, in Jewish tradition, there's the idea of what we call Kidur Mitzvah. A mitzvah is a commandment, it's an obligation. And it's assumed that if we follow the mitzvot, if we follow the commandments, we'll be decent people. You know, we'll, we'll be partners in making the world a more holy place. And hidur mitzvah literally means making the obligation beautiful. And it can take the form of a beautiful candelabra, beautiful calligraphy, beautiful adornment of the sort that Amina does so well. It, um, it, can, it, can, it can be involved with ritual objects, but it can also be involved with other mitzvot. And for example, one thing I've been thinking out a lot about in terms of what I've been doing is the quote from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, when he marched to support the black American freedom struggle, he said, I am praying with my feet. And something I've been asking because I've been making lots of signs and banners is what does that mean to make the mitzvah, the obligation of working for justice and against racism more beautiful, literally, by well-designed banners and signs. That's also Hidur Mitzvah. So the idea, the idea of making the commandment beautiful can be spread out into a lot of different activities. So what, what I'm hearing you say in part, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that is that art is not only kind of essential to being, it's sort of, you know, when God creates the world, it's sort of um, our, our creation is, a, is, a, is an echo or a reflection or a continuation of that. And, and also I, I hear a thing about art in, in, your, in your conversation around it's serving a larger purpose for building up the community and for working for justice, which is something I would never have thought of myself. I just, is, did I get that right? Essentially, yes. Um, one thing as a Jewish activist for peace and justice that I've noticed is that, frankly, sometimes political activists are boring. They're good people, but, but I've been in many situations where people were trying to educate the public about an issue, and they were very dependent on piles of paper and such. And artists were able to come in and, and show other ways to do it that engage people differently. And, and I've seen, so I've seen art in terms of being very effective in helping, um, in empowering the work of making a better world. And that actually ties in a little bit with what you asked me earlier about about what Jewish tradition says about art, because returning to the figure of Betzalel, the first artist in the, in the Bible, he's got three kinds of knowledge that are mentioned. And, and there are different kinds of knowledge. One is very technical. The other is being able to look at something and differentiate its different aspects and then make a synthesis. And the other form of knowledge working with the Hebrew is passion and is a very passionate knowledge. It's, it's intuitive and it's passionate. And these are the kinds of knowledge that God has shown using to create the world. So I know it's a bit of chutzpah to compare artists like Amina and I to God, but I think it also teaches us something about how art, artistry 
can be brought to real life situations because it combines these different approaches. We have to be very technical. We have to use the craft, but we also have to do something more intuitive than that and then bring it all together. So uh, I next like, like to ask Amina about sort of the same question. Uh, what, what do the, you know, what does the Quran and, and other commentaries or traditions say about Islamic art? Something that I've heard um, many times, a lot of times in Friday sermons and um, other times is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, stated that God is beautiful and that God loves beauty. So the question is, beauty, it could be describing your character, could be describing your faith, um, but it could also mean outward appearance and um, visual beauty. So in the sense of art, um, Islamic art is, a lot of it is ornamentation. So there aren't many figural rep representations. A lot of it is ornamental and it's used to cover large spaces such as the interior of mosques and buildings or manuscripts um, as a means to add a sort of something that's pleasing to the eye, something beautiful, um, but not meant to sort of be the focal point. So it's, um, some people like to see it as, um, sort of a visual um, that doesn't take sort of precedence over the space, but rather as a means of beautifying it and um, sort of giving something just nice and pleasing to look at. I've, I've also noticed that art in, in mosques that I've been in um, serves to kind of orient uh, people to each other and to the space. You know, so the, the art on the carpet, um, other art on the wall helps to orient all of us in a particular direction, right? And, and, and then, but I, but I have noticed that after, while providing that kind of orientation and the beautification, um, what you're left noticing so much is, is each other. You're, you're, you're noticing the people in the room mm -hmm. and you're very aware of that and you're very aware of the of the person giving the sermon and, and the, those that are leading the prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, 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 is that part of what you're talking about? Yeah, you worded it very beautifully. Um, I had never thought of it that way. I guess when I enter a mosque, I it just seems so normal to me in that sense. But I, I love that perspective that you have provided. Um, yeah, so a lot of the mosque, a mosque is essentially a community center. It's not just an area where people gather for prayer. Um, it's an area where community events take place and the main focus and the main focal point is the community and a lot of times um, so every mosque in the world basically faces toward the same direction which is the Kaaba in Saudi Arabia in Mecca and that's just sort of provide unity for the Muslims so we're all facing the same direction when praying and so the interior of mosques are focused on that direction, which is called the Qibla. So you, it's very obvious when you enter a mosque, which direction you are supposed to be facing, which as you mentioned, is it indicated on the carpet and the Qibla wall? Usually sometimes you have, I, I believe it's called a Qibla niche or a mihrab. And that is sort of where the Imam stands for prayer. So that's sort of a bit of a, it provides direction that this is where we are facing. This is where the Imam stands and brings your attention to that. Yeah, which, which then kind of brings us to the next question, which what are, what are some of the limits or sensibilities around various kinds of images in Islamic art? Mm -hmm. So I am by no means an expert in this field and I don't have the qualifications to um, make any sort of um, claims up for everyone. But from my understanding and my personal understanding of the guidelines for creating art is that the imagery of people, especially faces and animals is prohibited. And from my understanding, um, that is to keep the focus on 
like I said, within the mosque, keep the focus on the community and keep the focus on um, your faith being um, about you, your relationship with God. So for, there are no, like, for example, there are no images of the prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, or like his companions and things like that, because yet yeah, he was a messenger of God and he, um, and at the end of the day, he is human like all of us. So there isn't any focus on people or faces. So instead, when you are in a place of worship, your focus is on your relationship with God. So there are no images of people in places of worship. And just like that in Islamic art, I believe my interpretation of it is that uh, images of people are prohibited. So as an artist, I do not draw faces or animals. So, and you'll see that in Islamic art, the three main components are calligraphy, which is the Arabic verse, usually um, verses from the Quran. And culturally, you'll have like poetry and beautiful sayings. And then second is um, geometric art, which is very um, ornamental and decorative. And it uh, has a lot of repetition. And thirdly, there's biomorphic patterns, like floral patterns, vegetal patterns. And um, a lot of the inspiration for these patterns, some of them comes from the Quran. Uh, the description of paradise. A lot of times when verses of paradise are mentioned, it says gardens with rivers flowing beneath. So that is, I think that's, that has been repeated so many times in the Quran, gardens with rivers flowing beneath. So a lot of in history, when you look at um, beautiful examples of Islamic architecture, they have these vast gardens and a lot of them incorporate water. Um, to sort of like um, sort of trying to um, the, sort of like the inspiration is coming from those verses like gardens with rivers flowing beneath. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Reiner, I'd be interested to know like from a, from a Jewish point of view, what are some of the sensibilities and traditions around the use of images? It's complicated. <laughs> and not surprisingly. Um, and there, there's a lot of discussion about what the Torah says about rape, about images and idols, and um, and the, and and of course there's very powerful writing about about idols that feel very very modern. You know the you know they're made out of, they're made out of gold and silver. They have eyes but they cannot see. They have mouths but they cannot speak. Um, those who make them are like them. And I mention that because a lot of what I've read really seems to be about making images, seems to focus on, on the power that we give to images. What are the different kinds of power we give to images? And so um, scholars have wrestled with that over the years. And and there's been a swinging back and forth. A lot of it has seemed to have been cultural and political or contextual. For example, um, Jews who lived in, in Muslim countries tend to have less of a, have a less of, historically have been more parallel with what Amina was describing. And Jews who lived in, in countries that were more Christian have sometimes been more involved in working with images. The thing seems to be what kind of power you're giving to the images. And, and, for, and in modern terms, a lot of synagogues, most synagogues that I'm familiar with do not have images of human beings. They may have images of other creatures. And that is still discussed. For example, I did a mural in the sanctuary of Congregation Beth Shalom, and there is a bird in it. And we had a whole discussion about that bird and what it meant to have a living creature in the synagogue. So there's really a push and pull. But 
at different times in history, there's been more images in, allowed in different places. It tipped it in on where you lived. At other times of history, things have been stricter. One thing that I think is striking is what's happened during periods of oppression. For example, there is what there's a whole school of, of Jewish art from from Central Europe and Germany that the bird's head Haggadah belongs to. That that Haggadah, that start, that Passover service was created during the time of the Crusades. And essentially what happened is the Crusaders on their way to wreak havoc in the Middle East, wreaked havoc on Jewish communities in Europe. It's logical that when people were feeling under attack, they sometimes became more fundamental in their beliefs. And so you see images leaving, no human images. Instead, you see artists showing the figures with the heads of birds because that was kind of a balancing act. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's complicated. Um, there's, there's a lot of old synagogues from uh, about 2000 years ago to 1500 years ago from, from uh, Syria and Lebanon and Israel and Palestine that do show um, pretty sophisticated visual representations. But again, you have to look at what they were being influenced by. And at that time, they were surrounded by Hellenistic Greek culture. It was a real cultural crossroads. So it's not surprising that there would be a lot of cross fertilization. So it's complicated. Well, you know, from a, from a theological sort of historical point of view, I can really understand in the Hebrew scripture the prohibition to idols because in in Egypt, um, you know the, the 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 sun god Re was um, you know, gave divine sanction for slavery, for the oppression of of people, and they of course had depictions you know of of all of those gods and giving that that divine sanction. And so what I what I try to emphasize when I talk about about idolatry, it, it isn't it isn't necessarily so much around the depiction of human beings or not. This is what I, I share from a Christian point of view, but rather it's it's the way you use images to claim that you have control of God. Yes, in such a way that you end up justifying giving divine sanction to the oppression of one group over another. And I think in the, in the same way, uh, historically, you know, there were so many idols uh, in, in the Kaaba uh, during the time of Muhammad that were, peace be upon him, that were, that were utilized in a way that was also controlling and also produced a lot of income <laughs> for people. And so again, like the, the prohibition against using human images or animal images um, is, is a way to say, to stay far away from the idea of using of, of using religion to control people through images because they're so powerful and and using those images to to justify oppression which kind of goes back to some of the conversation you had about using art on the street you know to 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 quickly and and powerfully express uh, the value of human beings absolutely and one thing I didn't mention I want to be very clear about is that in the Jewish tradition, <clears throat> in the first place, God has no name. The, what is often translated as the name of God literally means was, is, will be. And, and God has no physical representation whatsoever. Yeah. So the painting by Michelangelo from the Sistine Chapel of a figure of God reaching out and touching the fingertips is very, very foreign to the to Jewish tradition. God has no manifestation. The closest thing it comes that the closest manifestation of an image for God in Jewish art sometimes might be kind of an abstracted hand, mm. like kind of like the Hamsa. 
that's the closest I've ever seen any representation of God. And that's also really quite unusual and really not, it, it actually goes back to that period of time I mentioned 1500 years ago. But uh, God has no form. The form of God is in us because we're created with Selim Elohim in the image of holiness. Amina, is there anything that you'd, you'd like to share about that? Um, first of all, I, I found everything that both of you had mentioned very beautiful. Um, and you worded it very beautifully that images have a lot of power. And um, going off of what Rainer said, um, God in the Islamic tradition has no um, sort of representation or physical representation that um, there's no representation of God. And the same with human beings, um, especially important figures such as prophets and messengers and companions of the prophets. So because um, images have so much power, you do not want to sort of divert from um, the essentials of what your faith is and give meaning to these images, which goes against what God has commanded. Yeah, it's so interesting because as a, you, as a child, I grew up in a church that had stained glass windows. Mm -hmm. And it had a very, um, you know, it was a lot of Norwegians helped start that church. And uh, <laughs> Jesus was exceedingly white. <laughs> he, was, he was luminescent, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I do remember looking up as a child and seeing an image of Jesus carrying a small lamb you know, with other lambs around, like leading other, other lambs. And it was a very welcoming and powerful image for me. And, and I know that the whole idea of a stained glass window is to be able to sort of tell a scriptural story in, in an image. And that was especially important in the Middle Ages um, when, when people, many of them didn't read. And so they could look around the, the church at the cathedral and basically see a lot of the stories and, and, and attach their memories of those stories uh, to, those, to those images. Um, and, and I think that, you know, part of what Christianity was, you know, kind of trying to do with art is, is to sort of talk about the, you know, from a Christian perspective, the embodiment of for, sort of full humanity in Jesus. So we're not really trying to turn the image or the photo or the, or the stained glass window um, into God, right? It's more, it's more trying to help us see the beauty of the, the creation, the beauty of God's image in the art so that we can see it in the people around us. But I, I think that, that, that often that there are times when when I think Christians today tend to trip into more idolatry around the idolatry around their leaders or the idolatry around their, their theological perspective or the idolatry around their group, that, that to be saved and to be loved by God is to be part of this group and to be hated by God or not God, for God not to love you is to be outside this group. Um, so I, I, I think it's a rich conversation. <laughs> Um, and I, I guess the sort of the next the next you know question might be um, how has modern experience of you know different social changes, political movements, you know cultural movements, how is it continuing to to influence uh, your artistic traditions? And Reiner, I'd like to start with you. If one thing about Jewish art history is that in the first place it has to do with what kinds of spaces were available for people and for in much of the world Jews didn't have a very um, a very stable life and so there became 
there be there was an emphasis on what Abraham Joshua Heschel calls the archi architecture in time rather than in space. Because if you had to pick up and move suddenly, what were you going to take with you? You could take you could take your literature, you could take your beautifully calligraphed Torah scrolls, hopefully, you could take a kiddush cup, you could take your candlesticks, but you couldn't take your bu a building across the border. And so I think that that, in addition to what we were talking about, about imagery and how that uh, wasn't as powerful a force as, for example, in Christian tradition, meant that, that for a very long period of time, most Jewish art was really quite small, physically. There, was a, there were illuminated manuscripts. There were, there were beautifully done uh, calligraphed Torah scrolls, which of course have no art in them whatsoever, no visual art other than the skill, the calligraphic skill. And, and, you know, and ritual objects, that, that was Jewish art. And then in, you know, there, with, with illuminated manuscripts, there's a lot of beauty. For example, Jewish manuscripts from Yemen, um, being influenced by the Arabic culture around them, there are incredible what are called carpet pages, which are abstract, um, just like you were describing, Amina. And there's also work that was that's micrographic, where you're taking calligraphy and 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 doing artwork with the calligraphy uh, tracing forms. But in any case, that that really was Jewish art for a long time, because there just wasn't the political power and the and the stability to make to make bigger things, to make frescoes, to make beautiful synagogues, and so on. And and very specifically for Jews like me, who come, whose back, whose roots are in Eastern Europe, there was a lot of oppression, and there there were there was a system, there was systemic oppression that forbade people from owning land, that forbade people from you you know in towns you couldn't you couldn't build a synagogue that was viewed as competing with churches, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera when enlightenment began to come along, when political upheaval began to occur, that began to give the hope of more political rights and civil rights to Jews, we begin to see a shift. And there, and there really is an explosion of art, of Jews making art, making secular art that begins to occur in the late 19th century and moving into the 20th century. And then they, but they keep circling back to the tradition. For example, you have radical Jewish artists, politically radical Jewish artists involved in revo in using their art to further the revolution, making, making Haggadot, you know, the, the, the books that we use during Passover. And so there's this real dialogue going on Again, it gets really complicated, but I think that I think that the reality of of how Jewish created creativity had to be channeled for centuries, and then the opening up of our opportunity really creates an interesting tension in life. What I see now going on is that there's a lot of Jews who make modern art. Um, and, and are fully engaged in artistic practice the way we would see it in modern secular society. But it's really interesting to see how people are, go back into the tradition and are integrating it into the art. And sometimes it's very figurative, but when you see a sculptor like George Siegel, who took cast of human beings to make his sculptures. So they're very, very realistic although not necessarily realistic in color, but they're very, you know, they're these plaster casts, but he's showing the sacrifice of Isaac or the Akidah, which of course in Islamic tradition is the sacrifice of Ishmael. So 
there's a dialogue going on that's really fascinating. Meanwhile, there's very traditional artwork going on at the same time. So someone like me, I am trained in the classic tradition of figurative art, but I also do very Jewish art at the same time. You know, I, I think what I what I wish for my my home congregation and for many congregations around around the uh, the Christian Church would be if there was a way to take some of those images of Jesus and change the some of the facial features and perhaps even the skin color on a regular basis, so that during a a, a worship <laughs> service you would see, you know, some kind of rotating uh, some kind of rotating device that would that would show Jesus, who obviously was a brown-skinned Middle Eastern person, <laughs> you know, um, and 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 not to blot out the 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 very the very you know pale Scandinavian Jesus, right? But to add to that, right? And I think there's a lot of work. There's a lot, there's a lot of conversation about that in the, in in the Christian Church right now, even about the color of our robes, which have been white, typically, and and. And that association of whiteness with purity or holiness, uh, perhaps problematic right now, especially for for Christian for Christians uh, who've been part of uh, white supremacy um, or at least have benefited from it. Um, so, Amina, what do you see happening um, right now in, in Islamic art in terms of sort of the modern uh, sort of socio political and cultural influences? Just a moment. And, and, and I would like to have Adam share his yeah, Adam would his like to draw well. hey. <laughs> So um, I like to consider myself still a student of Islamic art. Right now I'm in the process of uh, learning traditional Islamic art. Um, it's mostly on my own as I don't have the resources here. Um, what I learned quickly after graduating is that it's difficult to find the resources to learn Islamic art in North America, let alone just Canada or the US. Um, a lot of these resources are in Europe or in the Middle East. And um, so my goal first is to learn the traditional forms of Islamic art. And these are questions that I'm still sort of learning and um, interpreting for myself. So. This is something that I'm learning and something that I don't really know yet and something that I'd love to have discussion with other artists, um, Islamic artists. I haven't come across many here in uh, the Seattle area. And if there's anyone you know, <laughs> do let me know. I'd love to um, talk about these things. These are things that I think about a lot, um, the role of Islamic art, the role of art, and um, the role it has in our tradition and in our culture. So this is something I'm still learning and yeah, I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts. Thank you, Amina. And, and it, it seems to me that, you know, like, you know, going back to what you said earlier, you know, that a lot of folk don't have a lot of knowledge about, mm -hmm. about Islamic art and culture and sort of mm -hmm. sensibilities. <laughs> Um, I think in, at, at the same time, there are some people who think that they know a lot about our Jewish neighbors, <laughs> you know, that, that maybe don't. But uh, I just, I so appreciate the work you do, in, in, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in public settings with people to help them capture a different side um, uh, and, and a deeper appreciation for uh, Islamic culture and, and so forth. So I, I'm just, I can't wait to take a course from you at some point. Um, so I, we're going to do a couple of, of really great sessions uh, during Holden Interfaith Week. Amina is going to be uh, sharing a session on Sunday night. Uh, Reiner is going to share one on Tuesday night. And then on Thursday night, we're going to have a kind of a, a time for some Q&A, you know, and, and for some coaching um, on, on the webinar. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start with you, Amina, if, if, if Adam's going to let you do that. Um, uh, I should call him Adam. I'm sorry about that. So would you say Adam's name one more time for us, the way you would say it? Adam. Adam. Okay, sorry. So Adam, uh, how, how, uh, wh what are you going to try to teach and what do people need to, to kind of gather between now and then to be able to participate? So I want to teach, um, it's a beautiful star-shaped 
um, pattern from, I believe, 16th century Persia. So I, I chose this pattern because it has both geometric and arabesque components, the arabesque being the floral components. So to draw a traditional um, Islamic geometric patterns, all you really need, um, the main tool is a compass. So you'll, you're gonna need a good quality compass, a sturdy compass that can open up up to six inches, five inches, that'll be perfect. And a ruler, um, pencils, eraser. And for the process of transferring our pattern, we're gonna need tape and tracing paper. If by chance you don't have tracing paper, parchment paper, which you may have in your kitchen, works perfectly well for this. And we're gonna go through some, um, I'm gonna go through some step-by-step -step instructions and we're gonna do a little bit of geometry, but there's gonna be no math or calculations. So it's gonna be fun. And we're also gonna do a bit of free hand drawing, which is the biomorphic portion, the arabesque portion. And so a little bit of everything for everyone to really get a feel of just a little bit of traditional Islamic art. Thank you, thank you, Amina. And and, and Reiner, when you get it, when you start to share with us, uh, you can show us the compass again so that we can we can see it. So what what's going to be your session? What's your session going to be about? And what do we need to have to be able to participate? Well, first of all, I'm ready, Amina. Got the tracing paper and the compass. Um, my session is going to be quite different from what Amina is describing. It's what we're going to do is what is called visual midrash or artistic midrash. Midrash is the Jewish tradition of storytelling that's not written in the Bible. It's, we have two kinds of Torah, two types of Bibles. One is the written one and one is the one from the mouth, the oral Torah. And so Midrash fits in that second category. But what we're going to do is we're not going to just speak it or write it. We're going to make it into art. And, and the materials we're going to use are going to be very basic. Um, obviously, people are going to be making art scattered around the planet in this situation that we're in. But it's going to be cut paper simple drawing materials, glue, um, assembling a response to the text we're going to be working with. And the text we're going to work with is from the creation of humanity. And there's two texts that are right there in the first part of the Bible in Genesis. One is the first creation story, which is related to Adam's name because that first human is created from, from the Adama, from the earth. And there's a wonderful story about how all the different soil, colors of soil are brought together to make the human. So not, nobody can say that the, that, that the earth I was created from is better from the earth you were created from. But in any case, we're going to work with that story. And then there's a second story where God creates the human being, male and female, they are created. And the implication is that they are all, that, that they are one being. And then what happens from there? And um, these bring up a lot of questions about gender and a lot of questions about, about what it means to be human and diverse. So we'll look at some texts. We'll look at some examples of how artists have looked at these stories from art history. Maybe we'll be able to look at some modern poetry and such that have looked at these texts previously. And then we'll make art. We'll make our own visual midrash, our own interpretation of these stories. And what I do with that is usually give people a recipe. I'm not sure what the recipe will be yet, but what are the ingredients that you're going to show in your work? Who are the actors that you're going to show in your artwork? That's really great. So I, I'm just looking forward to this this so much. You know, the other 
three conver three uh, sessions we're going to have are going to be conversation and some interaction with uh, with those who are part of the webinar. <laughs> But it's going to be wonderful to have have a space to be able to do art together as well, and I just I, I'm just so grateful to both of you for being willing to to help lead us in that and give us that kind of that kind of experience. And so I just I just want to thank thank you Amina and Adam and Adam uh, for for being with us today. It's so he is so beautiful. <laughs> Hello, and Reiner, I'm so grateful uh, for your leadership as well this week. So what will happen is people will be able to take photos of their art and share it on Instagram with the hashtag Holden Interfaith Week. And then we'll be able to, to, to show that and we hope to be able to compile a lot of those videos together, uh, a lot of those images together into some kind of video or some sort of online display. Um, and uh, so just we want to let you all know about that. Um, uh, so again, we're going to be having three sessions on July 19th Yay. on Sunday night, on the Tuesday night, and on the Thursday night. We'll be having uh, sessions with Amina and Reiner. And then, and then that Thursday night will be a time for people to engage in questions, ask them any questions about this video or anything else that happened during that week. And hopefully be able to, for, for Amina and Reiner, to be able to share some feedback about some of the work that you've shared on Instagram. And uh, so we, we want to just thank Amina and Reiner again for being with us. We look forward to Interfaith Week when it happens coming up here in a few weeks. Um, you can learn out more about Paths to Understanding at pathstounderstanding.org. Remember to check out Holden Village at holdenvillage.org. Um, and uh, and, and uh, also encourage you all to check out the Facts Over Fear campaign, which is countering anti-Muslim bigotry that Paths to Understanding is co-sponsoring with some of our Muslim friends at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. And until we see you again, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thank you. Hey, Amina. Hello.